Thank you everyone for coming. Welcome. Hello, my name is Ricardo. I'm a librarian here for the Sacramento Public Library. Welcome to Activating uh, Spoken Word Poetry for Community Justice and Healing with our Sacramento Poet Laureate, Andrew DeFeye. Um, we're really, really excited to have Andrew here today. Thank you, and we're excited to have all of you here um, watching live and in the room. Thank you for coming. Um, just a quick note, uh, if you could put any questions in the chat, uh, we will answer your questions towards the second part of this program. Uh, you can access closed captioning um, by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window or on the YouTube event. Um, make sure you join us next Saturday, uh, November 20th at 2 p.m. for Art in the Streets and Books for Youth with Robert Luis Trujillo. Very excited to have uh, Robert a part of Activate Team series. Um, so I'm very, very excited to welcome Andrew here. Andrew is Sacramento Poet Laureate. Andrew's going to go ahead and take the stage and I will be here. So please feel free to write any messages into the chat. We will be right with you. Thank you and welcome, Andrew. What's up, y'all? Everybody can hear me? We can Thumbs hear you. up, heart reacts, something, some kind of reaction. Uh, so I'm, I'm usually a very in-person person. I would be collecting high fives from everybody right now if I wasn't in this Zoom room. Uh, so I definitely appreciate any kind of reaction uh, that, that definitely helps me out. Uh, so. My name is Andrew Defy, and I am the current Sacramento Poet Laureate. Uh, any of y'all know what a laureate is? You know what that big, that, that big word means? It means that I can fit more marshmallows in my mouth than any other poet in the city of Sacramento. Mark my words. Uh, none of them want to see me. Uh, OK, OK. What it actually means is that I am considered an expert in my field by my peers, which is a huge honor um, in Sacramento. We have some incredible poets. Uh, this is the poetry capital of California, as I always refer to it. Um, so it's a, a huge honor for me. Uh, I'm the youngest poet laureate in Sacramento history. Poet laureates are usually quite a bit older than me. Um, and, and they are usually professors. And I... I'm a rapper, so you know there's that. Um, so we make a history out here. Um, if you hear little claws tapping, that's because there's an adorable little pug running around in your foot, uh, trying to make herself comfortable. Uh, so you know, I figured you know since we're talking poetry, uh, let me let me start us off uh, with a couple of pieces. Um, so I want to start off with this first one. is a new poem, brand new. Um, and it is called The Pokey Poem. And it goes like this. How are you feeling? I mean, good, bad, or ugly. Underwhelmed or unstoppable, empty, exhausted, accosted by all of it in search of a power button or an off switch with your hands or your heart first, more like a wave or a starburst. How are you feeling? My niece said, pokey. <laughs> So I placed my palms on hers and said, feels pretty smooth to me. She responds on the inside. And I felt my fault lines begin to give way. I said, baby, I know exactly what you mean. Sometimes there are earthquakes in my voice because I'm scared I won't pronounce love right. She looks puzzled wondering why I would fear the only language she's ever heard me speak in. She says, how the rocks are soft on the bottom of the river. They weren't always, you know, the water has to flow to make them like that. I drop every constellation I was holding on the floor and we laugh new galaxies into existence. I told her it took me years of therapy to understand what she had just said. Sometimes we carry rivers behind our eyes and that's why some of us grew up in deserts Boys don't cry. She says, they're just not really something to try and stand on because it gets all slippery. 
I tell her no one has ever been more right about these fragile concepts of masculinity. She explains that the earthquakes are just mother nature dancing in my throat. And the only way to mispronounce love is by not trying. She says, maybe porcupine should cry more. I ask her if I can write a poem about it. She says, absolutely not. At which point I bribe her with ice cream. And after we finish, I ask again, how are you feeling? She says, a little bit smoother. See, someday I will talk to her about mental health and generational trauma, systemic oppression, and how our bodies are big enough to house the top of joy and the bottom of grief. But today, today I will simply tell her that we all feel pokey sometimes and the ice cream never fails. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Uh, so <clears throat> I want to start off, start off with a little piece uh, lately that I've been working on. You know, I've been, I've been really focused on um, how we use our, our art and our talent and our creativity to heal in the wake of the trauma that we've all been through in, in the past two years, um, right? There, there's post-traumatic stress disorder that's happening all around our communities. Um, and I, I know the power of words. Um, what we do here is magic. Oh, you don't believe me? Why you think we call it spelling when you write words, right? Poetry is how we speak ourselves into existence. Right, I come from a culture in hip hop that, you know, when when hip hop started, folks didn't have instruments, right? Didn't have a, a, a lot and, and made do with what they had. And, and we learned how powerful our, our words were. Um, you know, you guys may be familiar with a rapper named Lil Wayne. Uh, he was signed to a rap group called Cash Money Millionaires. I have a poem, it's a three line poem and it goes, Cash money millionaires weren't when they named themselves. You see what I'm saying? Like you speak things into existence when you write them down. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of my, my background. You can also, if you have any questions at all, you wanna type into the chat, you are more than welcome to type into the chat at any point. Um, also, if you visit right here on the Facebook at Sacramento Poetry Salon. It's a new project that we got going on where we are just trying to amplify the voices in the city. We are trying to, uh, you know, kind of give all of the resources in one space. Um, it's called Organizing and Centralizing. And uh, it's one of the things that my elder um, teaches me and, and consistently is reminding me about is the, the importance of organizing and centralizing everything. So head over to the Sacramento Poetry Salon. Uh, we're doing some really cool stuff over there um, and got all kinds of opportunities. I think we're gonna have some contests coming up, maybe some cash prizes for some contests coming up. Uh, so stay tuned to all of that. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my history in the city as, as to where my art and my, my activism kind of intersect. Um, so I was a communications director at a spot called Soul Collective Arts and Cultural Center. Give me a thumbs up if you've ever heard of Soul Collective. And if you haven't, make sure that you go check Soul Collective out. Yeah, good, good, good. Um, so I was the uh, communications director there for a long time, for from 2009 to 2020. Um, in that time, I also started a little arts collective called Zero Forbidden Goals. And when we started Zero Forbidden Goals, um, ZFG, um, the idea was to push to change the culture of the city, right? Which it sounds like a really big thing. Um, so I'll give you one, one example of this. A really concrete example is, um, you know, for a long time, people wouldn't book hip hop shows. Right, you couldn't play hip because people thought of 
what you hear on the radio is not all of hip hop. That's part of it. That's part of rap music nowadays and we don't wanna discredit them. But there's also a very conscious side that's rapping about political issues and humanitarian issues. And it was all lumped into one and you couldn't book hip hop in the city of Sacramento. And we didn't like that. And we knew, now I am clearly of European descent. Um, and most of my collective is my black and brown family, right? Um, and hip hop music comes from black folks and brown folks, right? And so when we're talking about it not being allowed in certain places, then we're talking about racism, right? Um, so we wanted to make a space for hip hop culture to, to be included um, because it is, it's one of the, the, the most universal cultures on the planet. It's recognized by the UN, by the United Nations as a culture, right? Um, so one thing we started doing was these little things called guerrilla art flash mobs. Gorilla, not like, you know, the, the monkey, the, the, like, like gorilla, like the warfare, um, you know, where you, you just kind of blend into your surroundings, right? So the idea was that we would push, uh, just, just push places to, to understand how beneficial hip hop culture was. So we did these things called guerrilla art flash mobs. I'm going to try to share a screen and I don't think my sound is going to work when I share this. Um, but, oh, oh, I don't even have it pulled up right, right now. Um, but I'll show you a little video of, of what it was like. But what we would do is we would run up into spaces um, that, so there was an unsuspecting pizzeria, there was a barber shop, there was a restaurant that had a patio. And we would just set up a phone line where people could call in and be like, where's the next flash mob? And they would give them directions. Um, cool. Um, so we would just direct people to be at this place at 8.08 p.m. and we wouldn't tell the business. And then we would show up and everyone would buy something, right? So we're supporting the business. So these places are having the best nights. We started out and it was 50 people that came through and I was so excited. I was like, wow, we really did something big here. And then the next week we did it and it was 100 people. And then the next week we did it, it was 150 people. And then it was 200 people standing on the lowbrow porch in Midtown Sacramento. And the cops got called. The cops had to run. Uh, uh, what's going on here? I said, poetry, poetry officers, right? Uh, expression. And so it opens doors to a lot of these spaces that then see how beneficial that hip hop is and the hip hop culture is. We just helped your business make more money than they've made on a Monday night ever, right? Um, so that's kind of where I, where I start. Uh, at that point, there was one night uh, at Lowbrow where I, stood, I used to stand up on tables and I would yell to start everything. And there was one night that I got, up, I got up and I stood up on the table at Lowbrow and someone yelled, that's the Guerrilla Poet Laureate of Sacramento. And I held that title and I still hold that title um, really close to my heart and, and maybe more so than the actual Poet Laureate title because the people gave me that, right? Um, so, you know, in, in this thing, the, the fancy word that a, a lot of nonprofits like to use for it is creative placemaking right? Creative placemaking. You make a place and you make a safe space for, for folks to come together and, and, and build community. Um, and one of the first rules I always tell people, and I cannot stress this enough, is that we build with and not for. Okay, I'm going to say that again. We build with and not for. When I go into a community, I build with the community. I ask them what they want and what they need. And then we work to provide that. We never walk into a community and say, well, we think that uh, if you just had an open mic here, uh, the kids would have something to do. And, uh, and they may be, yeah, we don't need an open mic here. 
these kids want to dance. We have a dance community. Do you have like, if I bring poetry to a community that wants to dance, they're not going to be interested. Right. So in, in everything that you're doing as you're working in the community and, and working to build and organize and centralize in your community um, and, and in other communities all around. Right. Always work with not like build with not for. Right. So I'm going to always hammer that home. That's one of my my like foundational principles is that you're supposed to build with and not for. Um, so from there. Uh, we, we get a little notorious for taking over places and being that, that little poetry crew that runs around. Uh, so we wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, so we started our next activation was this thing called chain link poetry. And you can look chain link poetry up. Uh, maybe even we can find uh, ZFG chain link poetry on YouTube, maybe find a link and pop it in the chat. Um, this video uh, or, or this activation. Okay, I need, have y'all ever seen magnetic poetry on people's refrigerators, the little words that are on the magnets, and then you move them around and you kind of make up words and you write all kinds of poems on the refrigerator. All right, Millie's seen it. Uh, some of y'all have, okay, I see a couple other folks have seen it. So that was the idea was I wanted to build a big public installation of magnetic poetry right, where people could make it say whatever they wanted to. And part of the idea with that is y'all know how often you're hit with advertisements that tell you what to dress, how to dress, what to drive, how to eat, right, like all of these things, but no one reminds you to dream. They're always trying to sell you something. They don't, they don't want to just cheer you on. I want to just cheer you on. I want you to walk down the street and, and see something that says, oh, I could do it. I can do this thing. Even if I'm having a hard day, somebody cares, right? So what we did, so here's, here's also, you know, part of community organizing. I like to tell people I'm a professional failure. Listen close. I did not say professional failure. I said, I'm a professional failure, which means I have failed at a lot of things, <laughs> which all led to me doing something like that, that leads to the process. You have to be able to fail and you have to be able to give yourself grace because that's how you get to the, the end game, right? You, you have to be not good at something in order to get good at something, right? Um, so uh, we thought about how do we do this magnetic poetry thing and then I got all excited about it and then I priced it out and magnets, it turns out, are really expensive, really, really expensive. There was no way we were going to be able to do this set, right? So then, you know, instead of walking away from the idea, we start thinking, how, well, how do we do this then? Right? So we came up with this way where basically we got card stuck and we put it in uh, page, the page covers, the plastic page covers that you use for like reports at school, right? So cardstock in there. So you design the cardstock that has this word on it. And then you design, we had people draw what that word meant to them. What is light or love or power or peace? What does that look like to you? So that's part of the exercise is visualizing, right? So people are, are drawing those. Then we put them in the plastic sheet. We duct tape them up behind the back because duct tape is your best friend as a creative. And we put coat hangers. We duct taped coat hangers to the back of the cardstock so that they hang on a fence. And then we went and hung it on a chain link fence downtown. And it was the coolest thing to drive down the street. It was right by La Garnacha on 16th Street, if you know where that is. Um, and it was the coolest thing to drive by and see that people had made this thing say something relevant to them, or they had left a message of hope for other people in their community, right? Um, so that's a that's the next uh, the the next phase of it, right? Um, and then we get into uh, you know we start getting asked to do these in schools, 
And so we did one at a, around CB Circle, if you know where that is in Sacramento. Um, and the kids were so worried. They said, the big kids are going to take them. They're going to mess up our set. They're going to do it. I said, look, if the big kids, like, I'll come back here this weekend. And if the big kids mess up your set, then I'll come back and make another one. It's fine. We got you. And we came back. And these youngsters, like fourth and fifth graders, on the weekend had walked over to the school and were playing a game where they wrapped the words, like someone will pick a word off the fence and someone else will have to wrap it. And then they were just picking words off the fence. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen done in my life with one of our activations. And it was just because we decided to, to put some art there, right? Um, it wasn't always, we don't always wait to be asked right um and and it's a it's a thin line too because you know you you also have to respect every you want to beautify the place right so when we went into venues and we went into places and we popped up and did these flash mobs i hope you heard me say that everybody had to buy a slice of pizza right uh every like folks came back to get haircuts right so folks patronize those businesses because we have to have those relationships we depend on each other right um some of the other uh, activations that we've done, we have a big one, big one every April called National Guerrilla Poetry Month that started in Sacramento and has made it all around the world. Uh, it was covered by the U.S. Embassy in Ghana. We've had entries from Mexico City. We've had entries from France. We've had entries from South Africa. Uh, it is it is one of my favorite things, and it really just started with I wanted to document people spitting their poems, my favorite poets in the city spitting their poems, but I wanted them to do them at relevant locations or really wild locations, right? So some of them, like, you know, Terry wrote a poem about school and the education system, and then we filmed it right in front of JFK and like on a walk in front of JFK, right? Um, some of the other ones though, the, the, the really fun gorilla parts, um, there is a video of Ann Cap Cap. We went to Seafood City in South Sacramento, if any of you are from the South, uh, went to Seafood City and Ann got into a shopping cart and her boyfriend pushed her in the shopping cart and she's wrapping her poem down the aisle of the grocery store while everyone's like, what is going on? Poetry. And it's exciting. It's not boring. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm really bored and so are you. Like this is, this is exciting. Um, and so that's always been, you know, kind of my passion is in, I, I love poetry, but I also, I get bored of poetry the same way anybody else does, right? Like, um, I, I need I need passionate poetry. I need exci I need full contact poetry. Um, so that's that's what we've worked to bring to Sacramento. Um, and I, I think you know, five or six years later, um, you know, there there was a young man. I don't know if any of y'all listened to Hobo Johnson, uh, but Hobo Johnson played his first open mic ever at my open mic, right? Like now he's traveling the world, playing huge festivals in trailers next to Cardi B, right? Like um, this city really became a place um, that thought about some cultural equity, right? That, that at least had to be confronted with it, right? They didn't always move on it, but we made them think about it. We, we brought it to their attention that, yo, what you're doing might, might be racist. Right there, you you might be acting out and upholding some racism. You might yourself not hate black and brown people, but you're upholding a system that that holds people down and oppresses people. And I'll give you another example of this real quick. Is so busking is when you play music in the streets, right? You've seen people drumming on the streets. Maybe you've seen the drummers on the buckets after the Kings games. That's one of my favorite acts in town um, as far as busking goes. But there is a rule in the city of Sacramento that you that says no drumming. No drumming specifically. It doesn't say no musical instruments. It says no drumming. Now, when you dig deeply into this and you really think about it, right? If you look at European folks, 
my ancestors, my music goes back to stringed instruments, maybe some piano, right? But mostly we were strings, we were playing lutes, we were playing banjos, we were playing violins, we were playing all kinds of stringed things. Where if you look at black and brown cultures, the drums are very central, that rhythm is very central. So when we say no drums, this is a racist policy, right? This is something we need to look at, how it's biased, right? And, and what I love um, about y'all's generation, the teenagers right now, the Gen Z kids, y'all are my favorite. I am your biggest fan for the way that you just relook at everything. You don't take it just because we handed you something, right? I always use the example that, my generation, my older brothers, they handed me this busted Tonka truck that they've been playing with. And I was like, oh, the wheel's a little wonky and the paint's messed up and it's got a little rust over here. But I guess, I guess we'll play with it. I guess we can, we can use our imagination. And y'all, we tried to hand that to you guys. And you were like, no, we're not playing with that. That's no, that's not a toy that we want to use. We're going to make our own toys right? We're going to make our own toys. That's what I love about y'all. Um, in fact, last year, while the, uh, while the uprisings were going on, um, what I saw was the young poets in this city were the ones that were holding the microphone and holding the megaphone and leading the chants. And not only leading the chants, because they weren't leading chants that we've been yelling in the streets since I was 18. They were writing new chants, right? They were bringing new energy. That's what Gen Z does, new energy, right? Y'all are the, the new battery to the movement, right? So as I'm watching that, um, you know, I get, I get really, really inspired um, by y'all. And so I wrote the only real poem that I wrote last year, you know, uh, the, the pandemic was hard. Um, and I was, I was solo for my, for myself most of the time. So I was working on just keeping my mental health all right and, and, and staying cool. I didn't have it in me to write, you know? Um, and I always like to give, like, if you're a creative, if you're an artist who like over the last couple years, you're like, oh, I haven't been able to be easy on yourself. We all just been trying to survive, you know what I mean? Um, but this is the one, the one real poem that I wrote last year. And it's really like a love letter to Gen Z and how just impressed I am by y'all. And kind of, it's almost like me being like Papa Bear about y'all where like, you know, a lot of folks my age and older, you know, they, they, they real quick to be like, oh, the kids, they're just sitting on their phones all day. And then we watch. And we see that when Donald Trump's trying to do a, uh, a, a an event, that y'all bought up all the tickets and <laughs> made it so that he couldn't sell out the event. You mess what you're doing on your phones. You know what I'm saying? Y'all learned like there 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 are really efficient ways um, to to move and to create movement um, in this new era. And and I just really like. I just really appreciate y'all and I'm y'all's biggest fan, Gen Z. So this one is for you. And then I'm gonna take some, uh, I'm gonna take some questions. World War Three is love versus fear. And we don't even have the right words. We're just making way for the ones who do you who deserve so much more than justice humans deserve so much more than liberation we deserve so much more than freedom they don't hear me these are small words freedom comes with the implication there is something other to be freed from Peace has become transformed to a tool of fear, something to keep rather than something to give away. 
divine balance gets closer. Holy Father, we pray. Holy Father, we pray. Holy Father, don't you ever forget how holy my mama is. My friend Harley says the reconciliation is being live streamed in real time. And that word found home in my bones. Revolutions happen daily, however beautiful. I don't want to be revolving when I leave here. I want to be reconciled. We are answering the equation of us struggling with the remainders of they grasping at words just past our tongues that connect it all. So we say what we mean because that's all we know how to mean. But these kids will not be limited by the words we give them. They know mouths don't always call the same name hearts do. Let them pray in their own tongues and watch how ancient the dances get together. These kids know sometimes the right words aren't words at all. They're simply vibrations in rhythm and harmony. Thanks, y'all. And thanks, y'all, for being you. Uh, so, yeah, I think at, uh, at this point, uh, I want to open it up to any any questions that, that folks might have. You can just type away in the chat. Uh, I will definitely keep an eye on that. Um, here we go. Here we go. Uh, you make music, art, poetry, all of which is in support of community building. Did you imagine anything like this? when you were a kid. You know, uh, it's funny, it's funny, because something that I always say, you know, um, I also want to dispel a myth right now that uh, formal education and higher education is for everyone. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of push um, for people to go to college and to, to get that higher education, and I'm not knocking it, I think it's great. Um, and, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of empowerment that can come from that. Um, but also, if that's not for you, there are a lot of ways to get educated, right, in whatever you want to do, right? Um, so myself, I barely graduated from a continuation high school, and it wasn't because there was anything wrong with me. It was because I have severe ADHD, um, and I was bored, right? Uh, so I barely made it through a continuation school and I always tell people that the two things that I like, I got in trouble constantly because the only two things that I did in school was interrupt class and write poetry. I had a big book and I would just sit there in class and I would just write. I had a lot of feelings inside of me that I needed to get out. Right. Uh, so it's funny now because I tell people that those two things that I used to get in trouble for every day are the two things that people pay me to do now, right? Um, so whatever your, whatever you do, there's a, there's a way to, to capitalize and to empower yourself in, into it, right? Um, so, you know, that's, that's part of that, like, zero forbidden goals, right? Like, I like to write poetry. People always told me there's no money in being a poet. I figured out how to make some money being a poet, right? People pay me to do my poetry. Now I have this title that allows me to go into spaces and talk to people about poetry, right? Um, so, you know, they're, they're just whatever it is. If you're like, yo, I don't really, uh, I just want to play video games, man. Then, then, then figure out like what that looks like. Cause there are folks who just play video games and get money for doing it, right? Um, so it is researching like what the process is and, and then like just doing the work, right? And dedicating yourself to it. Um, but, you know, for me, it's, it's an interesting question because I was also, you know, I'll tell you a little bit more of my stories. I was born without stomach muscles. Pause, think about that. Think about what you need stomach muscles to do. That's stand up, that's walk, that's maintain your balance at all, right? So um, due to that condition and all of the medical procedures and everything that, that came with that, I had so much 
inside of me that needed to come out. And that's why I wrote, right? But at 16 years old, they told me I wasn't supposed to live past 15. So if you ask me, like, did I think that I, what I thought I would be doing as a, as a teenager, like, I didn't think I would be here, right? So every day to me is, is extra innings and, and a chance to really, like, you know, live, live. Um, so, you know, I, I say that to also say that, like, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great outlet um, for that. And that's, it's really like how I survived my teenage years, not only my own, you know, the, the complications from my condition and, and medical trauma and all of these things, but also just, it's hard being a teenager, you know, you, you, you like coming into adulthood, you're not quite there. There's a, like, it's a lot, it's a lot. And so for me, like writing was definitely like saved my life in, in that time frame, especially, um, so yeah, that's my, that's my extra long answer to that question. Um, but yeah, uh, the things that I was really good at, um, I, I'm still good at. <laughs> I just figured out a way to, uh, to, to get money and stop getting in trouble for them. Um, yeah. When did you start connecting with mentors as a young person? Uh, so, you know, I think mentorship comes from a lot of different places. Um, so, you know, I would say like my first mentor, my dad's a minister, my mom led the choir, like those are my, those are my spiritual mentors. Um, you know, they taught me about faith, they taught me about community. Um, you know, I think for writing, there's, there's one teacher specifically, right? I was in my yearbook class. I didn't even, I was in a yearbook class, like in a newspaper class. I didn't write for either one of those. I didn't write stories. I sat and I wrote my poetry and I wrote my, my, what I wanted to write. And I had one teacher, Mr. Virgil Doogie, who I still keep in touch with to this day. He's the only teacher that ever, I won't say he's the only teacher that ever cared about me. He's the only teacher that I felt like ever cared about me. Um, and he ran up on me one day and was like, yo, what are you writing in that book? I want to read it. And I said, no, you absolutely can't read this book. This is my diary. And I don't abridge it. I don't censor it. I write all of my feelings in this thing. Um, and he said, I'm not going to get you in trouble. I just want to, like, I'll give you credit for writing because I see you write, but I just never see what it is. But I'm not here to get you in trouble. And so I gave him my book. And when he came back the next day, he had shoved a bunch of his poems into my book. And they were very sensitive poems about the divorce he was going through and, and his wife was trying to take his kids. And it was, it was a lot, you know, uh, he could have gotten in trouble for that. Um, but he addressed me as an adult, right? He addressed me as a writer. Um, and he's the one who told me what you're doing is poetry. He's the one who, who gave me my first copy of the Outlaw Bible of American Poetry, you know? Um, so yeah, that was, that's, that was my first real mentor. And then I got a lot of mentorship from, you know, I went to workshops, I found older folks. Um, you know, I also, uh, I got a lot of mentorship from my friends, my peers. That's the other thing too. People, you know, when we say mentor, we often think of someone older, but, but what it is, what that word means is an expert advisor, right? So if, Justin knows how to Millie rock and I don't. And I'm like, yo, can you teach me that dance? Then Justin is a mentor because he knows something I don't, right? So we're all mentors and there's mentorship everywhere. So I definitely want to like uh, hit on that as well. Any more questions, y'all? Oh, oh. I like this question. I like this question a lot. Uh, the question is, being a public person who makes art about self-expression must be challenging. What self-care tip would you give to you? Now, I would say number one, don't read the comments ever. Don't ever read the comments. Uh, <laughs> it, it sounds... Like I'm making a joke, but I'm not making a joke. Uh, because people, there's a disconnect. They forget you're a person, 
right? When you're just a video or when you're just a piece of content, then they forget that you have feelings and that you're a person. Uh, and I am a poet and I'm a cancer on top of that. I'm sensitive about my art and about everything really. But uh, for me, it's definitely like I, I keep a I keep a bubble around me um, as far as like the energy that I'll allow in if I put up a video. Again, I, I don't generally, you know, once it once it goes outside of my circle, right? There are people that I want to get their feedback. Yo, what did you think about this? How was this? Right? Uh, I have a poem, <laughs> I have a short poem that goes, "Never consider the opinion of anyone who hasn't done your dishes." And that's lightweight how I feel about it. Um, you know, if if I love you, then I care what you think about my art. If I don't know you, then I'm probably not going to read your comments, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you at a distance just because I I can't. What well, I'm I'm supposed to create when I got a hundred voices in my head telling me what what's good, what's it? I felt this, I didn't feel this, um, and then I think the other the other part. Um, that I'll say, you know, we have a motto around here at ZFG, and that is, uh, let them talk while you're working and they can shut up when you finish, right? Which means like, not everybody's going to catch the vision. When you're like, yo, I want to, I want to write a book. I want to start a TV show. I want to get on Netflix. I want to, whatever your vision is, not everybody's going to be able to see it. And there's going to be a lot of people that don't think that you can do it. Th that means they can't do it. They've decided for themselves that they can't do it. That don't got nothing to do with you, right? So let them talk while you're working. And then when you're done and they see, oh, oh, he really did that. Oh, he's really the youngest poet laureate in Sacramento history. Shh. Right? Um, so it, it is that, that idea of like, you know, you just gotta be really tunnel vision sometimes as a creative, um, to just create what, what you feel, what you're called to create, right? Like, I feel like creativity is really like a connection to something bigger than us. I'm not going to give that a name, but that which is bigger than us, um, is what we're communicating when we create. Um, so, you know, sometimes not everybody's gonna understand that connection. Not everybody's getting the same information that you're getting. Not everybody sees the same vision, uh, right? So it's really just about like, keep your head down and, and keep a few folks around you. You know, my closest friends aren't yes men, you know? Like the, the people who are closest to me are the people who pick my art apart. And I know it's because they wanna see me succeed. Right. So I keep a, a lot of people around me that'll tell me like, yo, you're doing too much over here. You're doing because I only need to listen to this, this handful of people who love me. The, the, the rest of this, like y'all can feel about the art how you want to. And then and, and I'm just going to keep making it and keep focused, you know. Um, so so that's that's really it. You know, you, you got to listen to you. You're the expert. You're the expert on you. Can nobody tell you about you? Can nobody tell you what your purpose is? Can nobody tell you what you're capable of other than you? You know. I, I definitely remember having that feeling when I was younger that, um, that I knew what I was doing. And I had a bunch of people around me who were like, yo, you don't know what you're doing. You're not, what do you mean you're not gonna go to college? What do you mean you're not gonna? Like, no, but I spent 10,000 hours in workshops sitting with elder poets who were amazing with their language, right? Um, you know, I, I knew what I was doing. And I feel like a lot of times we do that to teens where like, you guys have a vision, you know what you want to do, right? And we as elders should be figuring out how to like, uh, how to help you get there and how to help you map the steps out rather than being like, well, you know, no one makes money as a poet. Like, no, nah, let's figure out how to help you get money as a poet let's change that let's not have starving artists anymore so you know that's a again you know you go fire off questions I'll, I'll give long answers all day um but yeah that's that's definitely uh i think the the sage advice that i got for you today
Mm. 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 What is community healing? Man, that's a that's such a deep question. Um, you know, it's uh, it, I think it's something you you can feel. We've we've all felt that whether it was whether it was a, a church group or a community group or a group of folks at the library or a summer camp or a, like we we know what community feels like, right? Um, and, and to be welcomed back into that community where we hold each other accountable, but we do it out of love, right? Um, where it's not like, oh, you messed up. You're out. You're out of the community. You're canceled. You're no longer worthy of being a person. You're no longer worthwhile. You're now worthless. And um, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in throwing people away. You know, I've been a lot of different people in my life and some of them were better than others. And some of them offered more to community than others. Some of them were really, really selfish and really destructive. Um, but now I do a lot of really, really beautiful things. Um, so I think community healing is about that accountability and then about recovery right and, and and figuring out how to help people recover from some of these traumas and 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 dig deep to what it is right like so a lot of times when we talk about like secondary emotions and and the things that are underneath right like you may uh the the little kid went over and hit this other little kid well it wasn't that this kid was mad at this kid it was that this kid had some big feelings that he was feeling and didn't know how to feel and had some stuff going on at home had some some trauma that was unaddressed lost a parent or a grandparent recently and didn't know how to deal with it um so i think it's really digging down to the causes of where some of this pain comes from and understanding that and, and learning to be gentle with people and and that we're all on that process we're all on that path we're all healing from something everyone you meet is healing from something so giving people grace to know like i'm healing i'm messed up from something uh so this person probably is too so let me let me not let me not just attack right let me listen let me let me come in love um you know one of one of my mentors estella sanchez says fools be tripping hit them with that love energy and and that's become a real mantra of mine um over the years and i think that community healing is that love energy um that we're talking about hitting folks with um and and just that grace and acceptance and accountability right um because there you can't heal uh if someone's allowed to continue doing damage right um so it, it is you know finding folks who are doing damage um who are you know upholding some of these oppressive systems and and really figuring out um how do we how do we hit them with love when fools are tripping <laughs> any other uh any other questions I think we got a few more few more minutes here. I'd love to hear from some of y'all. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. My two artists, acts, writers, they recommend to teens. Man. Um, okay. I'm going to go with, I'm going to give you a poet and a rapper that I really love. Um, poet. Buddy Wakefield. Buddy Wakefield to me is the, just, that's who I aspire to write like. Um, he just has no bounds in the way that he uses words, but he paints a picture that you can't help but see very visually. Um, and it's just really wild. Uh, so Buddy used to be a slam champion, slam champion from all over the world. This competition, this competition, this guy, you got belts. Um, and then decided he was done with slam and he didn't want to do poetry for scores anymore. Um, and he didn't want to compete. He just wanted to write poetry and it is some of the most powerful poetry ever. So Buddy Wakefield, 
is the poet that I would give you. Um, and he also does a lot of like workshops right now. He's doing some really cool like teaching stuff. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you are a young writer, uh, definitely stay tuned to what Buddy's doing. And, you know, if you're like, yo, I want to take one of these workshops, like maybe we hit me up. Maybe, maybe we could figure out how the poetry salon can, can help support that or, uh, or something, you know what I mean? Um, and let's see the, the, the rapper I'm going to give you is from Sacramento. His name is Dre T. Um, man, Dre T comes out of Soul Life. We started a record label at Soul Collective. Um, Dre T is one of the most prolific lyricists um, ever. And the beats bang. Like, that's the thing. You can't just, I'm, I'm from California. I've been here my whole life. You can say whatever you want to over a beat, but if it doesn't bang, I'm not listening. I don't care. Let's just be real about that. So uh, I highly recommend Dre has slaps that also like really address some topics and are really about some things without being cheesy, without being corny. Um, also, you know, I'm going to throw out there, I know, I know there was only a couple at, that it asked for, but uh, also throw out the Philharmonic, um, who's doing some really amazing work right now, also off Soul Life, um, and co-produced a couple albums of mine ago, uh, and the album called Ultraviolet, um, but just an amazing musician, amazing lyricist, um, and also from Sacramento, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is that chance for you to be like, yo, I messed with that dude before he was blowing up, before he was doing Bonnaroo and Coachella, because it happens. It happens. People used to say that it, that it couldn't happen out of Sacramento until, if you look right now, Zaya Bell is on the, she's number six on the R&B charts on Apple. She's from Sacramento. Destroy Boys was number one on the rock charts a couple of weeks ago. They're from Sacramento. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of talent that's coming out the city. So, uh, you know, stay tuned to your, your local city because eventually the whole country going to know about it and you'll be able to be like, man, I went and saw them for like five bucks at a coffee shop one time. So, you know, uh, last one, tell us about joy, man, joy, 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 joy is at the center of everything. I'm writing a book right now called the great joy hunt. Um, that will be a 30 day workbook where like every day you'll get like an activity, maybe a little poem, um, and then an exercise um, to just do to cultivate joy. Um, you know, I believe that happiness comes from the outside. And I believe joy comes from the inside. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's everything I'm, I'm trying to get my little, oh, oh. and sometimes joy comes from here. Uh, so yeah, joy, um, we're going to be breathing all hard in the mic. Um, so, you know, just this idea that happiness comes from outside, joy comes from inside. And how do you cultivate that? And how do you cultivate joy even in grief? Right? I've been in a lot of grief lately. I lost a lot of friends these last couple of years and it hurts and it hurts and how do you cultivate joy? You know, in that first poem, the pokey poem, I say that our bodies are big enough to house the top of joy and the bottom of grief. Um, so I, I believe joy is, you know, how, how the human spirit prevails, right? Um, radical joy in the face of oppression, right? If we're, if we're steady marching in the streets and we're fighting against things, but we don't have moments of joy, then what are we fighting for, right? Joy is what we fight for. So, um, you know, it's, it's having these practices in play, things like, yo, I got a playlist. I got a feel good playlist that when I'm having a bad day, these are the songs that I listen to because I know that they get my vibe higher, right? Um, it's things like watching your Facebook, right? I only interact with hearts and wows on Facebook. I don't like, anything because it, it messes up my algorithm i only i'm only here to respond if i love it right and then number one it works with my facebook algorithm but it also works with my personal algorithm right that i'm not spending time being mad about things and hitting angry reacts right um so there's a lot of a lot of keys um 
about joy that, uh, you know, that, that are going to be in this book called The Great Joy Hunt. It's going to be in Oprah's list of favorite things like 2023. OK, so stay tuned for that. Um, but also on my on my YouTube channel, there is a whole series. I started this year doing a morning show um, called The Great Joy Hunt and I had a bunch of guests on. Um, and a bunch of tips and, uh, and and all of those tools. So if you ever need to like cultivate a little bit of joy, then uh, holler at me. I see another question from a teen. What projects would you see yourself working on in five years? What projects would I see myself working on in five years? So I just applied for a job, a job, a job. I told myself I'd never work a job again, but I applied for a job as a news reporter because I think being on the radio would be really cool and being able to interview folks and, and kind of highlight some of these, these conversations, right? Um, the, the couple of other people who are gonna be part of this series, I'm a huge fan of their work. I would love to sit down and interview them. Um, so, you know, I think that's part of it, like some media work I would really love to be doing. I also wanna, uh, you know, I wanna write that book in the next five years and I, I really wanna tour the country telling people about this this joy hunt and and about how we just how we pull ourselves up right how we get from a one to a ten um in, in a day you know how how is it that we keep our mental health up and we keep our spirits up so that's definitely like what i plan to be doing in the next five years is a lot of like motivational speaking um i'm working on a set right now that includes that pokey poem um, that'll be like an, an hour long motivational speaking, poetry, self love, maybe some beats. I don't know. Uh, it's all, it's all coming together and I'm catching the vision right now. Um, so I'm in that, I'm in that place of creativity where like, I'm just listening to the universe as it like kind of flows through me, um, and not listening to anyone else. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm very much in that that place I was talking about earlier, where, you know, we we working, we working right now to, to put the vision together. But that's a that's a great question. And you know, you should be should be always looking at like, you know, the, the coming years, don't put too much in it. You know, um, I think we all saw, you know, 2020, I had a whole list of things that I was going to do. And then the whole world shut down. Right, so don't put too much on that. And also, let me just close with this for teens. There's this thing where it's been passed down that like there are these polls of like, this is what you should have by this time. And this is what you should have by this time. And by the time you're 18, you should have this. And by the time you're 21, you should have this. And then you should be married and have a kid. And like, don't fall into all of that, y'all. Don't fall into all of that. Y'all live in a very different world than your grandparents did, who are the ones that are handing that down, right? Um, you know, it, it's, we, we don't live in the same economy. We can't buy houses with the same jobs that they did. You know, there, there's a lot, and if you hold yourselves up to, to someone else's ruler, then it's just gonna hurt you. You know, like you, you judge yourself on your own growth. You know, if I plant two seeds next to each other and, and this one starts to pop up in, in three days, does that mean this one's not going to? Nah, and it doesn't mean this one's gonna have better, better fruit on it either, you know? Um, so just, just take your time and, and don't hold yourself up to anybody else's standards. You are the standard, you know what I mean? Um, and with that, you know, zero forbidden goals. You do whatever you wanna do. Thanks, y'all. Fantastic. Th thank you so much, Andrew. Thank, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, I, I think everyone here has learned a lot and a lot and has felt a lot. So we super appreciate your time. Um, this powerful afternoon. Uh, just FYI, this program will be replayable. So you will be able to see it on our Sacramento Public Library's YouTube page uh, instantly. Uh, it was streaming live. So um, Make sure you join us next Saturday, uh, November 20th at 2 p.m. for Art in the Streets and Books for Youth with Robert Luis Trujillo. Uh, Andrew mentioned that's somebody that uh, they've worked with before and is incredible, so we're excited to have them here. So on behalf of the Sacramento Public Library, um, thank you so much for being here and have a great afternoon.